Um, and he's director of the UCL Institute for Human Rights um, and also a lecturer in human rights and political theory. Um, I came to know Salafid in ma many different contexts within UCL, uh, within the union. Also, um, Saladin sits on UCL Council, does amazing work there. And I had the honor of working with him um, around um, the work that he was heavily involved with in the protection of statute 18, which is the protection of academic freedom. And I've just been absolutely impressed by the way that Saladin engages with these issues around ethics and justice um, in the context of UCL. So I'm very happy Um, I should try tell you a bit about my training first. I'm, I'm trained as a, a philosopher, primarily, although I'm based in the Department of Political Science, so I'm classified for all sorts of purposes as a social scientist. Um, and in the past, not only I, I sit on the uh, directorship of the Institute for Human Rights at UCL, but in the past I've also had sort of hands-on ethical experience in the sense that I used to sit on um, Ethics Committee A, which was the Research Ethics Committee for UCL's medical research uh, for a number of years, which led me to see a number of cases come up and have to deal with actual practical questions. So um, my branch of philosophy isn't quite the branch that's been mentioned so far. I don't come from the what might be described very broadly and actually unfairly as the continental school of sort of philosophy. I come from more the Anglo-American analytic branch. But I think there's enormous overlap and, and very useful and important overlap. So I'm not going to sort of stake any, any territory with that. I just wanted to declare that up front. Um, so in, in facing um, this question, um, I was prompted to give this particular talk by a debate that took place um, a couple of months ago, I think it was now, in which uh, UCL's activities, in particular the, the activity that's been mentioned by Jane, uh, to do with work with taking funding from and investment in fossil fuel companies, um, was debated in a public forum uh, to discuss whether divestment was an ethical necessity. And at that same debate, um, two deans of faculty um, stated an argument as to why we should keep our hands off this question. Uh, and one of them was meant to be here this morning and didn't turn up um, yet. <laughs> there is hope. And the other one is the dean, of, the dean of Engineering. And their primary argument, one of their primary arguments, was an argument from academic freedom. So they argued using an argument for academic freedom that it is the freedom of universities as academic institutions to make certain decisions about their collaborations, associations, and that goes as far as including their investments, such as the investment into fossil fuel. And what I wanted to do in, in my talk is to explore that argument a little bit further to see if it, if it uh, stands up to scrutiny. Um, you can see from my face what I think, but <laughs> I'll try and give you some intellectual reasons for considering that argument a bit more deeply. Um, it's said often that, that uh, philosophers, especially of my branch of philosophy, analytical philosophers, are characterized by the fact that if you put them, 20 of them in a room with a problem, uh, once you let them out again, they don't come out with a solution, but rather 25 different ways of actually restating the problem. Um, or making distinctions about it. But actually, uh, if we go back to what ethics is, um, originally understood sort of in the, within the wider context of the notion of morality, it's a, the question about what we should do. It's the praxis question. What should we do? And for me, that's important. That My question isn't what standards there should be, what, um, what values we should follow, but uh, should be followed in some kind of abstract and um, detached sense but actually much more central to you as people in sitting in a university at this moment in time, what should we do within, say, this university about questions such as fossil fuels and divestment? So let me just quickly explain the argument that was put forward. 
I, I, I broadly sketched it. The argument that I want to tackle said, basically it goes something like this. Um, well, first of all, advancing research through investment is important to universities, and therefore curtailing that in terms of universities' investments uh, through divestment of fossil fuels represents a harm to academic freedom, the right of universities to pursue investment in research and teaching. That, uh, that argument, you can take it or leave it. The second one was the more interesting one, the second part of the argument, it went something like this. Universities, including their employees, should not be dictated to as to who, with whom they collaborate. One way of changing the behavior of organizations such as fossil fuel companies, such as BHP Billiton, is through collaborative work, is through engaging them actively, working with them in such a way as to try and transform them, or at least transform some of their priorities. So restricting investment by universities into those kind of companies also restricts the ability to collaborate with those organizations, and therefore the ability to engage in transformative participation, you might use those terms as the more relevant value here. Um, and therefore restricting investment restricts and dictates both with whom academics should collaborate and in turn who they should seek to influence and as a consequence is an unpalatable form of a restriction on academic freedom. That's the argument. So let's, let's test it. For me, in terms of the experience that I've, I've had um, trying to actually grapple with eth direct ethical questions, I'm a social scientist, but I did grapple with medical ethical questions. That is one, that is a model. What is it that's distinctive about ethics? What is it that makes something an ethical question? A lot of people have talked about specifics of context, of detail, rather than very high principle. Um, and that's right. Ethics is, unlike morality, maybe, morality is the wider question of what people should do generally, how we should be, how we should behave, what virtues we should ex exhibit, if any. Maybe there aren't any that we should all exhibit. Ethics is specified to certain forms of activity in which there are other values, other important things in play. So for example, you're all academics. There are things in play in academia, incentives, motivations, and values, all of them important, which push you in a certain direction push you, for example, in the direction of publishing, of teaching better, of getting better scores from your students, of achieving more in the ref so that your department considers you uh, in, in high standing and maybe doesn't consider you for redundancy if that should ever come around you. <coughs> These things push you in a certain direction. There are other things that push you. Excellence in itself pushes you. The wish to publish that book, to make time to research things so that you can think about things more clearly, push you in a certain direction. And those things push you, sometimes push agents in directions that cross certain lines. And, the, and coming to conflicts with other kinds of valuable things, such as respect for other people, respect for their choices, their decisions, respect for their work even. And it pushes things in directions that sometimes become blurred. You have a blurring in this push and this conflict between what you are seeking to achieve and what you're required to achieve in your profession and the ways that are reasonable or acceptable in achieving it. So sometimes this blurring takes the form of dilemmas. You remember there was that student paper that you read for an exam, anonymous exam, and in that paper, there was a brilliant argument. And you think that argument, if it was taken up by a professional academic, could be made into a fantastic piece of work. <coughs> this is clearly fantasy, but <laughs> let's say that did happen. Um, it could be made into a fantastic piece of work. And then you realize it's an anonymous paper. You will never find out who wrote that argument. You can never cite them or acknowledge it. You could say, student paper number 3XYZ0. But that's not that helpful. Do you? in pursuing excellence and turning this piece of knowledge that should be exposed to the world, take it and use it, or do you do something else? Or do you acknowledge it in some strange way? 
It's an ethical dilemma that's posed by a push in the direction of knowledge, also in the direction of personal advancement, but also comes up against a challenge about acknowledging other people's work, other people's ideas, etc. In med medical ethics, a typical case that you would get on ethics committees would be where the push came from a, a knowledge advancement through human research, research using human subjects, and where there would be an offer placed to those subjects, which is now in, 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 in modern parlance is put in terms of compensating them for their time, not actually compensating for work or anything like that, but you know, offering an incentive for people to take part in, in research. And a constant battle we had was of balancing the desire to carry out this research and incentivize the research, which in some instances, as all human subject research is, carries some degree of risk, and in some cases some considerable degree of risk, balancing that aim and that push against the rights of the individual and the motivations of the individual and the consent, what really means, what really consent means in such a context. Because if you up the incentives, if you say offer not 20 pounds for your time, but 2,000 pounds, then you're potentially enticing people into risk in order to get the research done, but, but that conflicts with the idea that you should be giving them a much more kind of informed and less impelled way of arriving at a consensual uh, decision about what they should do with their own body. <coughs> constant tension, and that's the tension that creates questions of ethics. That is what ethics is essentially about. It's the arrival of the tension because of the internal values and the internal uh, benefits of a particular activity, and how those end up clashing with other questions, other lines that need to be drawn. Um, so let, let's characterize in two ways. Two things arise out of ethical questions like this. The first thing is it conflict, tension and conflict between internal pursuit of the activity, whether it's academia, whether it's medical ethics, whether it's um, professional ethics in other spheres, whether it's corporate ethics, the internal activities push you in one direction and they conflict with values and importances. Let's characterize those values in terms of avoiding imposing um, unreasonable risks or costs on people. I, I use those words advisedly because we can't often, we, we cannot avoid imposing costs on others um, and even risks on others. You know, by driving a car, you are imposing risks on others because you are heightening the amount of traffic that there is on the streets and that heightening of traffic creates risks with regard to other people using the street. But there are unreasonable risks, which is what ethics focuses on, and part of the, the, the art, it's not exactly a science, part of the art of ethical judgment is trying to get those risks right, but trying, which is the important part. So part number one is conflict. But with conflict, and with the drive from the internal values of the activity, comes another element to this ethical question, which is what I, I can, for the purposes of here, call blurring. There's a tendency to try and blur the conflict in order to get rid of it, to try and blur its terms, to try and rewrite the question uh, as an informed consent question that has been solved as opposed to a conflict that needs to be resolved in, in a more careful way. And this question of academic freedom in relation to our interaction with say fossil fuel companies, but also companies that might have interesting records, shall we say, with regard to human rights standards, is one typically where you see both these uh, elements, these two horns arise, the conflict form, in that there is a conflict between the drive to invest, as stated by our good deans, that universities need to invest money uh, in order to carry out research and in order to carry out teaching, um, or conflict between, and, and that, and the fact that you're collaborating with organizations that might have um, unpalatable records, should we say. Um, and the conflict between a desire to engage those organizations and change them in some way in order to try and overcome some of their less palatable behavior. And of course, 
at that point is where often you get the blurring. You have the conflict, and let's solve it. We can blur it by saying they are unpalatable, but we're trying to change them. We're trying to work with them from the inside, to help them become better. And therefore, to restrict us in doing that is to restrict a valuable contribution of research and teaching, university, association, and collaboration. In order to step back from that a bit, let's just consider what academic freedom actually means. Academic freedom is um, actually, in the UK, is defined legally. Uh, it was defined in the 1988 Education Reform Act as um, ensuring that academic staff have freedom within the law to question and test received wisdom and to put forward new ideas and controversial or unpopular opinions without placing themselves in jeopardy of losing their jobs or privileges that they may be given within their institution. That's a very kind of curt definition of, of what it is. But it means basically freedom to pursue research and debate questions and to teach questions in, in a format that includes criticism without interference. <laughs> UNESCO principles have backed up academic freedom for people working in uh, academic institutions. The Higher Education Act 2004 backed this up with a further statement which incorporated reference to institutions themselves, not just individuals. So this says in section 32 um, that uh, it puts upon the director of the Office of Fair Access a duty to protect academic freedom, including in particular the freedom of institutions to determine the content of particular courses and the manner in which they're taught, supervised or assessed, mm -hmm. and to determine the criteria for the admission of students and apply those criteria in particular cases. And there are a number of other other uh, standard setting documents that define what academic freedom is. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, the best work that's been done on academic freedom is in the United States, where there is a strong tradition since the 1940 principles on academic freedom were set up in the United States as a standard setting document. 240 uh, education organizations have upheld those principles. We don't have that tradition here, but there are some principles in law. And you'll be aware that the most common way that academic freedom principles come up in the news is when there's a conflict between a particular academic's work and the universities wish to try, and, a university, government, or other organizations wish to try and interfere with them, being able to actually express their views or carry out that work. That's not the bit I'm interested in today. We could talk about those things. We could talk about Stephen Stalaiti. We could talk about um, some recent things that have happened to UCL with regard to people saying things publicly. But actually, my interest is in the institutional side. So it has, academic freedom has this institutional side. It's that that's been relied upon to argue that it's the freedom of institutions to do whatever pretty much they want in terms of whom they associate with, collaborate with, and invest in. Um, but here I rely upon the work of a UCL professor, Professor Eric Barrett, who's based in the Faculty of Law, who wrote a fantastic book, the title of which is Academic Freedom and the Law. It was published in 2010. Um, and Eric provides a fantastic argument in which he says, yes, you can divide academic freedom into individual freedoms to pursue things and to question ideas <coughs> within certain limits. And institutional rights to control certain things like admissions criteria and educational curricula and certain forms of research programs that take place within their institution. But it says two things. They're within certain limits. And the limits are ethical limits first. Legal limits, of course, you must operate within the bounds of the criminal law. And this is going to come up now more consistently with the new terrorism legislation that's going to be coming up. But it's within the limits of ethics that I'm concerned with more than with the criminal law. And more importantly, Barrett shows that the institutional right of academic freedom piggybacks on the right of academics as individuals to carry out research and question ideas and teach and debate questions within their institutions. There's no independent notion of an institution having a freedom to do what it wants because it has academic freedom. There is rather the notion of an institution doing those things that permit and facilitate individuals carrying out their academic freedom within the confines of ethics. Because I'm running out of time, what are those confines? 
Um, something that hasn't been mentioned in the standard setting today, and maybe this is a brief for a piece of, I said at the beginning, of, of our praxis, a piece of action that maybe we should try and follow through on. There is an organization, or what should I say, a standard setting body at the highest level, which is at the global level, and it's called the Global Compact. And the Global Compact is an organization that uh, the UN set up. It has buy-in from seven different UN institutional bodies, from ECOSOC, the Economic and Social Committee of the United Nations, support from the, gen from the General Assembly, and you know, was pursued and put forward by Kofi Annan in the first place as the Secretary General of the United Nations. And it sets standards for corporate bodies, but not just business corporate bodies, but other kinds of corporate entities, including universities. And the standards it sets are standards to uphold human rights, to not be complicit, this is principle number two out of the ten principles, to not be complicit in the violation of human rights or complicit with organizations who are involved in the violation of human rights. And it also sets standards in terms of the environment and sustainability, and it sets standards in terms of corruption as well. And there is an academic working group of the Global Compact, and that working group has produced a manual called the Practical Guide to Universities in Instituting the Ten Principles of the Global Compact. And principle amongst those in terms of strategy are questions of evidence, of reporting, of transparency, of activity involving things such as impact assessments of every action that a university undertakes to demonstrate, if it wishes, to make this claim that in fact it is making changes and living up to some kind of aims within the changes it's making rather than just give uh, some kind of verbal assurance of that. So, in praxis, my recommendation would be that uh, should you want to, you should ask why your university is not a member of the Global Compact. It's not a difficult thing to do. It's a difficult thing to stay in if you're going to report things and be transparent. So it's a question that uh, carries a long tail with it. Um, but going back to the original question, conflict and blurring, um, there is no independent academic freedom right of universities to invest where they wish to invest simply that will make surplus and they will invest. There is a push internally from the desire to expand and facilitate research and education, and sometimes a push from wishing to influence the world in some way. But like I said, we should be aware of the blurring that takes place between the two sides of that conflict that resolves it on the wrong side, resolves it on the side of coming up with uh, interesting and creative ways of trying to show that actually the ethical Way. If you, through your transparent activities and your monitoring, you, you can show that actually the organizations you work with are changing, then maybe you have an argument. If, however, the push is simply for more resources because you're working in a, in a, in a market environment for universities where surplus is a, an imperative, then there's, there's more of a problem. So, to conclude, I know I to conclude, um, to conclude, to the original argument that academic freedom first protects universities from being questioned about fossil fuel investment gets things the wrong way around. If ethics limits academic freedom, then it will limit what activities universities can carry out. That doesn't start with academic freedom, it starts with ethics. And, and academic freedom is thereby limited. So in conclusion, all I'll say is that the argument that was originally put about academic freedom is somewhat of a red herring argument. Thanks so much for that. And as you were speaking, I was wondering if this project was fitting into the kind of blurring category and starting to feel a bit nervous about that. Um, but I think you set a very, very interesting challenge at the end. Um, global impact, uh, global contact.